Michael go dead, everybody would be the same, okay? Okay. Okay, uh, so just to finish up with the consent calendar, we are amending it to pull item E104, adoption of middle school mathematics. Okay, so 102, it's E102. E102, adoption of middle school mathematics textbooks is pulled from the consent calendar um, as amended. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move to approve. Okay, motion by board member Patapau. Second by board member Sellers. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed and the motion passes unanimously. And now we go to uh, reports and presentations. Dr. Collins. Thank you, Madam President. Tonight we're excited to recognize two groups, both a student group and a volunteer standouts. For our AVID students, I'd like Associate Superintendent Robertson to introduce our students. And for our volunteers of the year, I'd like to ask Associate Superintendent Hogarth to read those. And Madam President, if you would join me out front, we will um, greet these people as they come up. And when we get the individual groups up there, we'll do a photo. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Collins. So last month, we recognized our outstanding eighth grade AVID students. And tonight, we are honoring our senior standouts in AVID. To be considered for this honor, a student has a minimum GPA of 3.5, successful completion of two or more AP courses, 50 hours of community service and participation in extracurricular activities. As I call the student's name, please come up with your principal and your teacher. Our first student is from Del Norte High School, Katrina Salinas, and teacher Kara Heinen and principal Greg Mizell. Academically, <laughs> Katrina pushes herself to strive for excellence in all classes, including multiple AP classes. She understands the importance of organization and study skills for success and is of, oftentimes willing to share her skills with others who struggle. Aside from academics, she has shown school spirit cheering for all four years for Del Norte and has held the AVID Club President title for the last two years. UC Santa Cruz is receiving a gem from the Nighthawk Nest. We are so proud of Katrina and all she has accomplished. Congratulations. <laughs> Our second standout is from Mount Carmel High School, Nicole Toisan, and uh, teacher Susan Randall and principal Greg Magno. <laughs> the evidence of Nicole's embodiment of the AVID student is seen not only in her impeccable academic work and consistently striving to exceed expectations, but by her classmates. She is beloved because she sets a high standard, encourages others, and is the most thoughtful student you will ever meet. Her positive voice and drive for excellence will make her transition and success in college effortless. Congratulations, Nicole. Our next senior standout is from Poway High, Nayeli Fernandez, teacher Karen Kawasaki-Williams, and principal Ron Garrett. Nayeli has always stepped up as She's a hard worker who shows compassion and friendliness to help others. She has served as AVID president, participated in Key Club, volunteered as an AVID student leader at the AVID Summer Institute, and also as a high school liaison for newly established AVID Alumni Association. Nayeli challenged herself by completing six AP classes. She aspires to become a doctor specializing in maternal fetal medicine. This fall, she will begin her college journey at California Baptist University. Congratulations, Nayali. Our next standout is from Rancho Bernardo High School. Hara Marbe, teacher Leanne Marshall, and in place of principal uh, Dave Lamaster, we have Martin Casas Garcia. Held in AVID for six years, has been a member of our PLUS Club, Muslim Student Association, Human Relationship Conference Leader, 
and is a stat brat for our wrestling team. On Saturday, she teaches students how to speak Arabic and has participated in numerous community service projects. She brings commitment and inspiration to everyone she pursues. She truly has made a positive difference in the lives of her peers and our school campus. How does in yielding spirit will bring her to exciting new discoveries and successes as she pursues this next chapter of her life? Congratulations, Hada. And our fifth standout is from Westview, Amy Lynn and teacher Dorothy Carlson and principal Todd Casson. Amy Lynn has been a member of Westview AVID for four years and has served as an AVID executive member since her freshman year. This year, Amy served as our AVID executive president while maintaining a GPA of 3.4 and taking several AP classes, including AP Calculus. Amy is also an accomplished Polynesian dancer. Amy was accepted to University of Hawaii at Manoa, UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara, and UC Santa Cruz. Amy is passionate about helping others and will be pursuing the nursing program at San Diego State. Congratulations, Amy. Can we do one more round of applause for all of our standouts? Tonight, Powell Unified School District is pleased to recognize our three district volunteers of the year. As I call your name, would you please come up to the front and join us with your principal or supervisor if they're here. Our first volunteer of the year is from Canyon View Elementary School, Hiroko Goldstein Baba. You come up forward, thanks. <laughs> Hiroko is an active member of both the PTA and the foundation and volunteers in the classroom as well. A mother of two, bilingual and offering the perspective and experiences of a multicultural background, Hiroko is one of a kind. She volunteers countless hours to Canyon View Elementary School in numerous capacities. Principal Megan Battle says, I would use the term transformational, an inspirational leader and volunteer. She is humble in all that she does, and Canyon View Elementary School is extremely lucky to have Hiroko as a member of our parent organization and our volunteer community. Congratulations. Our next district volunteer of the year is from Twin Peaks Middle School. It's Patty Matsuoka. If you'll come up, that'd be great. <laughs> Patty was instrumental in founding the Kiwanis Builders Club BC at Twin Peaks to provide continuity from the elementary school K Kids program to Poway High's Key Club. Her leadership has brought together hundreds of Twin Peaks students, parents, and volunteers in service to our local community. Through Patty's tireless efforts, Twin Peaks Builders Club students have touched and improved the lives of children, adults, veterans, active duty military, families in need, cancer patients, and many others. Principal Dr. Kelly Burke says the impact of her efforts is considerable in the present and the legacy of her work is impossible to measure. She's a prime example of Poway's Parents as Partners tenant and we genuinely appreciate her outstanding commitment to Twin Peaks community. Congratulations. Our next volunteer of the year is from Poway High School, Rhea Vigay. <laughs> Rhea has been an active volunteer for Poway High's PTSA for several years. One of her first positions with PTSA was parliamentarian, which she took the initiative to learn and did an excellent job for two years. She joined other members of Poway High School PTSA and their outreach to Abraxas High School by providing meals for staff lunches and helping to set up, serve, and clean afterwards. Rhea has organized the hospitality for Poway High's Eye on Art, an event that showcases the diverse artwork of students each May. Principal Ron Garrett says Rhea is unique in that her bright personality and can-do attitude compel people to help out and make the people that work with her feel positive and valued. This is especially valuable for the students that are the beneficiaries of her efforts. Poway High School has greatly benefited from her gracious contributions. Congratulations. And that's my report for this week. Okay, 
thank you. And uh, as I mentioned, we are skipping the public comments since those will be taken during the particular items as they come up. And our first item is D201. Thank you, Madam President. Tonight, please open the public hearing regarding the Board of Education's initial proposal to the Poway Federation of Teachers for the 2015-16 school year. Okay, are there any questions on the Board of Education's proposal to PFT for the 15-16 school year? Okay. Did you have a question, Mr. Zeman? All right, seeing no questions, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay, motion by Board Member Zane, second by Mr. Patapal. Any further discussion? Um, yes, the, uh, the we're opening this up to the public hearing, so are there any speakers, uh, Mr. Clerk? Okay, seeing no speakers. And we have the motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And the motion passes unanimously. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to go to the uh, pulled consent calendar item. E-102, uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have a speaker? Or actually, uh, let me go to Super uh, Associate Superintendent uh, Robertson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, tonight we bring forward for uh, your action the adoption of the eighth grade mathematics textbook, uh, which has been uh, vetted through our teachers and comes forward as a recommendation as a core resource for eighth grade math. And are there any questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Clerk, Patapal, are there any speakers on this item? Yes. That was the one. Uh, 104. It w the, the numbers were wrong. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yes, Mr. Middleton, please um, come to the desk. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, one moment, please. So go ahead, you Mr. Patapal. The confusion on the number. Give your system. Name and, uh, My name is David Middleton, and I live at 12909 Homefield Lane in the city of Poway, 2064. Okay, last <coughs> year was, I think, the first year. My, my, I am the parent of a middle school child. And in seventh grade last year, there was a big struggle uh, for all the parents because the grade books that we had did not show any examples or give any explanations for us parents to help our children with. And I've heard you say that this textbook for eighth grade has been adopted by the math mathematics, mathematicians, the teachers, but we parents should be able to give some input into this. Because I say in the seventh grade last year, we were not able to help our children. And this, I came to a meeting here in this very room a few weeks ago, and a lot of the parents were making this same comment that they couldn't help their children. So what I'm asking for, please, is some parent resources for this next year so that we are able to help our children. And I had a brief word with Mr. Lee Hugh. In fact, I just spoke to him a few minutes ago as well, saying that they were hoping to make things better for the parents for this coming school year, for the eighth grade Common Core Math. So what I'm asking is for help, please, for, for all the parents, for some parent resources, so that we can help our children. That's all I have to say. Uh, Mr. Middleton, I have a question. You had mentioned a few weeks ago, what was the form 
that Mr. Your Lee, who I think it is uh, presided, presided at the meeting in which they presented the Common Core mathematic process and what was required for the children going on to hopefully attend the universities and colleges. But they didn't seem to have an answer for us when a lot of the parents asked, we need help to help our children. And so what was the, um, what was the result then of the conversation uh, as far as w what steps might be taken? Well, we were told that there were internet resources available but the internet resources are, n are not very straightforward. We have to go here, we have to go there, we have to go to the a Michigan site. There's no PDF format for downloading things. Uh, Dr. Robertson, would you like to address this issue? Or you want to refer it? Okay. Okay, because I, well, I, I know this had um, come up before. I don't know if... Uh, well, I guess what I wanted to ask is what would be satisfactory? Um, oh. Madam President, I'd like to bring Eric Lee Hugh, who's okay. our executive director, up, and, and he can share a little bit more around the work that we're um, planning uh, to do with our parents. So, oh, Eric. If, if I, but I just want to ask one question, uh, one more question before Mr. Middleton goes. What, um, I'm curious what would be satisfactory. You said that it was sort of scattershot what was available on the Internet. Would one portal on the Internet be satisfactory? or downloaded sheets or a textbook that included the um, instructions for parents? W would all of those options you'd be amenable to or? or most, comp most parents right now are in a state of confusion. And so we need something to simplify, you know, so that can be handed out to the parents at the start of the school year that will tell us where to look for this information. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. You may sit down. Uh, thank thanks. you. Um, Mr. Leahy. Thank you. As we focused on the middle school uh, math program and the initiation of a uh, connected math project, we have uh, had had a concerted effort to focus with the teachers and work on the te with the teachers. The program was selected primarily because it offers very rich math tasks, items you wouldn't find in a regular book, which are very heavily uh, focused on real world application as well as conceptual development, and our teachers are, are commenting that we're seeing uh, support with the program from our teachers. The program also is true that the homework sent home are those tasks and problems and to find the resources there's various websites. Working with Louise Armacost and um, other teachers, we are taking those resources using the MyConnect site and we are identifying them with the homework and having the idea is, and we're under development this summer, an open site so that if I have this problem, these sets of problems, that's identified, and then these worked problems where I can see how the problems are worked as well as resources, how do I help my, with this problem, are right there. And so the idea is that it is one-stop shopping where I can go and get those resources for every single set of homework problems that we have. They exist in this program, but they are diverse. They are disparate in different websites, so we're pulling them together under MyConnect so there's a direct link for the parent for each problem and has an easy-to-use guide. For those parents that don't have Internet access or for parents who don't want their children on Internet, then we would make a PDF version available for download for those parents. So we anticipate doing that for grades 6, 7, and 8 and having those resources available and over time augmenting those resources with video, Khan Academy, and other resources to support them. So we see that as a two-year process. But I want to thank Myra Monroy who's in, uh, in the audience who's leading that effort. She's right behind me, our MAPTOSA this year. And how do you envision that getting to the parents with the teacher just chapter by chapter or just say here's the portal for the whole uh, semester we, or trimester? Right now there'd be an, a portal in which it's organized by the book is organized by units of study. Uh, prime time focuses on prime numbers and those pieces. So you could you would look it up by the unit, and then it would go to the specific problems that the students are working on, and they would identify it there. So it's got a direct pass through. We also are hoping to have parent nights at the beginning of the year, talking how can we help our students with middle school math homework, understanding the program, and what we did in this meeting with our parents and translating that out to each middle school and have parent nights with our math teacher leaders. Uh, and Ken Matson, who will be our math TOSA for secondary next year. So that's on the docket. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric.
right, so this is an action item. Um, is there a motion to approve the adoption of the eighth grade mathematics textbook? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by board member Connor Radcliffe, second by board member Patapal. Is there any further discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, <coughs> and the motion passes unanimously. Okay, and now we're on to our uh, first reading items. First item is F104, public hearing of PUSD local control accountability plan for 2015-16. First reading, Associate Superintendents Robertson and Falandi. Thank you, Madam President. Tonight uh, we are presenting the first reading of the LCAP plan um, that uh, we have seen some of these goals and actions before. Uh, the difference tonight is we are actually going to be attaching uh, budgets uh, to each of these actions and plans. So I think our PowerPoint is coming up. Do we have any speakers? Oh, yes. Okay. Let me turn this on for you. Okay. Our first speaker on F104 is Richard Mason. I'm at 178074 Wasco, uh, San Diego 92128. This is a very formidable document. Uh, took me a good, de good, good deal of study to uh, get the hang of it. After that, it read well. I read both the Spanish and the uh, English versions. The Spanish enriched my vocabulary like the rendimiento, the performance. <laughs> uh, the goals were certainly very noble and I would say indisputable. Uh, obviously, it will take a lot of work on the part of all of you to and cooperation of the parents to uh, accomplish it. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't see anything about libraries in the uh, whole LCAP except for $30,000 for library materials in the budget. And then when I looked at the Spanish version, it said uh, materials for the library, $30,000. That puzzled me. But anyway, since 2007, I've been advocating for restoration of the library systems. And <coughs> I'm doing the same to tonight. Uh, particularly at Rancho Bernardo High School, we we had 186 classes in the month of April studying uh, research techniques. In 2014, we had 20,000 books checked out. We're just over overloaded, and to at least restore a library system. Rancho Bernardo High School. Uh, the other item that we're advocating is a line item in the budget for books so that I don't have to go out pounding the streets to get donations for books for the high school library. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Wayne Rouncevel. I live in Tawny Way in Poway. Um, I'm here to talk about the spending habits of the Poway Unified School District. Some of those, some of the results they get are amazingly great and they pay off. It's some really good, but sometimes they make real abomin abominable uh, choices. And 
this hearing is about spending money that's a gift from the state, in a sense. Um, the items you're able to spend money on or that the state is willing to give you money on have, they come from a menu. They're not something that's totally free choice. And I'm concerned that past programs that probably, I don't know for sure now if these have been part of the uh, LCAP procedures. I think some of them started before that was in place. But, you know, for a good example, uh, when there was a hearing recently about this, the technology infusion program in the school district. Uh, that started off with a big bang. You started buying stuff from the uh, L.A. school district who had simultaneously almost uh, was charged with crimes and blah, blah, blah and overpricing. And uh, fortunately, you caught on to that and uh, made some different decisions. Uh, the other one I can think of off the top of my head, which is a sort of a media name dropper, is the CAB program. And uh, that was a botched up thing where you spent a lot of money and now the people in this district are uh, arguably responsible for paying back loans that they never suspected they would have to pay. Um, I think that the uh, public needs to take into consideration every expenditure that it's made. This uh, board, a special board meeting said fiscal impact $23,782,000. That's a lot of money. I don't know, I have not had the time, or uh, and, but I will take it to read the plan. I guess we're going to hear something about it later on, um, sort of a summary of it. Um, that's a lot of money and a lot of room for uh, careless spending. And I just hope that the district is very careful about how they use that money, very careful about realizing that they're not giving the school district a free, the, the school district doesn't have a free uh, ticket to develop their own LSAT, LCAP funding uh, plan. It has to come from guidelines provided by the state and these days, that means the federal government's got a big hand in it. So you, anything you saw. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker, uh, Mr. Patapel. Our next speaker is Marsha Dodson. Hello, board members. Marsha Dotson. Um, my address, 8871 Polanco Street, San Diego, 92129. Just here to talk uh, just briefly um, and thank the board for um, working with College Bound, Concerned Parent Alliance Incorporated and College Bound programs to be able to, um, after 13, 14 years in the district, to really look at our model and uh, really enhance it this year and work with students in a pilot program. Um, hopefully we'll be a, possibly Rancho Bernardo. I'm not sure if that's been decided yet, but we're thankful to be a you know, part of um, the LCAP. And I, I know we submitted a proposal and there was a, maybe a little concern it was a little too high, but we're thankful that we can still deliver a quality program. And I appreciate you know working with the superintendent, Dr. Collins, and his support uh, and um, Everybody else who has, has really supported College Bound over the years, are, we've seen a lot of kids go through that program. A lot of kids, my own kids, have gone through it. Um, I have a daughter who has special needs, and she's actually gone through it and has benefited immensely. And I'm, you know, a, 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 uh, definitely a proponent of mainstreaming, you know, students in special ed to have exposure to programs like this. And um, but I just want to thank, you know, TJ for your support and coming out to College Bound. Um, but we're really excited to have the opportunity to uh, work with students this year throughout uh, the Poway Unified School District to, um, to um, work with the LCAP goals and to be able to sit here next year around May to be able to tell you how successful that it was. And uh, I just appreciate it. I've been a part of this for, you know, 13, 14 years now. And um, 
my kids are long gone out of college and we're on their own and but I'm really here to support the parents and the families and look forward to coming back to um, to see how the LCAP goes throughout the district. So appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you for allowing us um, to have the funding this year that is needed to make this a successful program. Thank you. Kim Garnier, uh, you didn't have any specific number down. You want to speak to F-104? Is that okay, just uh, F in general? Yeah, F in general, that's okay. I'm gonna be very, very brief. <clears throat> I have a little one at home with the flu, so it's gonna be 30 seconds and I'll be out. <laughs> um, my name is Kim Garnier. My address is 17124 Grape Arbor Court, Poway 92064. I'm speaking tonight with the Poway Parents Group. Um, regarding the budget, under a balanced budget, I would like, to would like to allocate funding to reduce class sizes and to increase funding for our libraries and support staff. Mr. Mason does an excellent job of bringing attention to the board, the importance of our libraries, and I just can't support that enough. So I hope we um, spend some of our money there. Under a balanced budget, I would like more buses, music, and PE programs. In a public school district, especially one as prestigious as Powell Unified, I think we should have all the help we can get with getting our kids to school. We need buses. We need music and PE when they get there. It's not just math and science. Um, and then speaking on behalf of a group that is growing near and dear to my heart, I would like funding for children with dyslexia. Uh, many families are struggling and dyslexia needs more attention. So maybe we can put that in the back of our minds and help those families out. And then to conclude, I just want to thank President Beatty and Trustee Sellers for serving our community and making brave choices. Thank you very much. Chris Garnier. Sending so out 20, uh, Chris Garnier, 17124 Grape Arbor Court, San Diego, California. Our text says Poway 92064. Uh, same thing, we got a, a sick 20 month old at home, so we need to get home. Uh, action item F, uh, F301, uh, first reading and public hearing of proposed 2015 16 budget. All I have to say from, about that is this. <clears throat> as part of the first reading, and as a member of the Powell Unified School District Parents Group, which I'm here supporting, uh, I urge you and expect the board to remain within a fiscal responsible balanced budget. Greater staff support to include more librarian time, greater time for our bus drivers, more time for our custodians, uh, as well as PE and art in every class and in every, in, in every uh, site that we have. Uh, Kim and I had the, the uh, opportunity to visit many of the um, not so uh, privileged uh, school sites within uh, Powell Unified School District, and we were, we, were, we were disgusted and disappointed without them having PE, without them having art. It's a shame. <clears throat> I want to make sure I stay on my time so uh, Trustee Patapow doesn't threaten to kick me out of here. Uh, we run the school district as a state lottery with the governor and Sacramento acting as the possible winning ticket. It's the responsibility of the board to keep John Collins in line and maintain a, bal a balanced budget since he's incapable of doing it himself. Thanks to Trustee, uh, to Trustee Sellers and President Beatty just for your courage. Thank you so much for your courage. Uh, and uh, your lack of dependence on a potential lottery ticket from the governor in Sacramento and exerting an effort to find more viable solution to balance our budget instead of keeping our fingers crossed and hoping things work, work out. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Darlene Willis. Excuse me, Dr. Willis. Thank you so much and good evening. I'm Dr. Darlene Willis and um, my address is 9336 Black Hills Way, San Diego, California. 92129. Uh, here on behalf of Concerned Parent Alliance and College Bound Programs, you already heard from Marsha Dotson, but I just want to reemphasize that we are excited about this LCAP plan, um, <clears throat> in particular for the College Bound Program, the partnership 
College Bound Power Unified School District. We know that it's going to work. It's been replicated. It actually started here in Poway and now is um, will take place again even more in depth, engaged, and we know that we will meet the uh, specifically the needs of the priorities of the LCAP. And I just wanted to point out uh, specifically priority or number 17, where inc increased culturally responsive parent community engagement and communication strategies in order to support student achievement. That program is in direct alignment with 17, 16, 15, 13, 9, and 8. And I'm sure we could even find others, but definitely those in making sure that students fulfill A through G, that they graduate from high school, and they have the choice of attending college. And I think this is a proven track record, and I really, really appreciate it. I want to just give kudos to Dr. John Collins, uh, who really went out of his way and has been for the last 13 years uh, in supporting this program, uh, even coming on his own time and <clears throat> making sure that it happens. So he and his staff deserve true kudos, and I just want to make that public this evening. Uh, I also want to commend Trustee Michelle O'Connor Ratcliffe and, and Trustee T.J. Zane, who also took the time to come out to College Bound and see us work. It's, it's one thing for me to describe it. It's another thing to come and see it. Uh, it's, um, it's hard to even put it in words what we do, but it is making a difference. And for 13 years, 100% of our students have graduated from high school, they have taken the eighth, uh, AP courses, they have fulfilled A through G, 100% of them have fulfilled um, the requirements and have had the choice of attending college. Um, and also 100% of their parents have successfully navigated the educational system, and that's what it's about. So I applaud this board uh, in advance for you uh, agreeing to this wonderful LCAP plan and the hard work that the staff has done to ensure that this has taken place. Um, and so again, Dr. Collins, Dr. Robertson, Mercedes, we really appreciate all of the hard work that this staff has done, and we look forward to once again now officially partnering uh, with Poway uh, Unified School District. So thank you so, so very much for allowing this opportunity. Thank you. Father Powell, do we have any more speakers? Heaven 104, no. Okay. Okay, and that concludes the public comment period. All right, thank you, Madam President. Uh, so, uh, like I shared before. It's in the same category. I'm sorry. Does she want to speak? F301 is, is Chris Shang. That's the, um, the budget. D did you want to speak now or wait until the budget? You well, okay, sure, let's go ahead and do that. Someone else spoke on the budget. We've got two different back-to-back -back oh. first readings. The first one's the LCAP, and then the second one is the public hearing on the right. proposed budget. Good evening. My name is uh, Chris Shum. I live uh, in north part of Forest Ranch. My topic is PUSD's deficit spending. I'm deeply troubled by the numbers of the past four years. In 2011 to 2012 school year, the deficit was $22 million. In 2012, the deficit was $34.9 million. In 2013 to 2014 school year, the deficit was $16.5 million. In 2014 to 2015 school year, the deficit was $29 million. The deficit has been hovering around 6 to 10% of revenue. In my opinion, this is very dangerous. If the deficit spending keeps like this, we will be in deep trouble in two years when the reserve fund becomes empty. PUSD residents have already been devastated by the new tax caused by the CAB. People have to pay additional tax starting in 2017. The tax will increase over the years and the last 34 years in total. If the current deficit spending continues, 
are we going to have additional huge tax rates again and again? In the discussion of a new school year budget, I urge you to balance the budget. The number one priority in Poway United School District is balancing the budget, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more. Uh, yes, and if you'd like to um, follow up with any more information, our Associate Superintendent um, of Business, Malaga Salandi, uh, could answer any questions that you may have. And the next speaker, Mr. Pedipo. Next speaker is Jenny Yu. Good evening. My name is Jenny Yu. I live in 10445 Rosedust Glen. My child goes to Monte Ridge Elementary School. I would like to comment again on PUSD's deficit spending. I think that it has not received enough in attention from PUSD administration. Poway Unified School District is not in good shape. On the contrary, it is in very bad shape. The con consistent huge deficit spending along the years have brought, has brought down the reserve fund significantly. The reserve fund will reduce to zero in two or less years. You will have nothing to cover. Urgent items arose unexpected, unexpectedly. I'm very, very troubled by the prospect. Mr. Superintendent, do you remember that the, cur the current debt rating for PUSD bonds is at BBB plus by comparison San Diego's Unified School District in, is in much better shape. They are rated AA by the same rating agent, Standard and Poor. PUSD's bond rating is among the lowest in the area around us. Even that PUSD is not in bankruptcy now, I think it is not far away either if PUSD does not stop deficit spending. Unfortunately, a school district bankruptcy does not automatically default on debt. All taxpayers will suffer the consequence through skyrocketing special taxes. I'm deeply, deeply concerned about this. Next, I would like to comment on budget priorities and a balanced budget. I talked with several of my friends who have kids in the same school as my child. Let me use this chance to speak for them. We urge PUSD set reducing class size as a priority. The class the classes are way too big for kids to get enough attention from teachers. We also urge PUSD to recover some programs which were cut through the years because of state budget cut. Please allocate some budget for STEM opportunity. Schools in other districts have been including extra curriculum to allow students to participate in STEM programs like UC San Diego STEM outreach programs. PUSD students have not had this opportunity. This kind of program will encourage students to be more involved in hands-on projects instead of just the textbooks or electronic devices based knowledge. Also, we would like to see street, uh, district funds to be spent on gate-related curriculum. The gate program has not been functioning due to the deficit. PUSD have a lot of gate identified students in elementary grades and in middle school and high school. We are not, ha we have not given the opportunities to empower their capacity to receive more in deep and enriched knowledge during the school year and fully develop their potential. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Panapal, that's it for the speakers. Okay, thank you, and we'll continue with the presentation. Dr. Robertson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so tonight, uh, we are going to present uh, the LCAP plan along with the uh, district goals. I'm, I'm sorry, with the district budget. So our outcomes, we, we hope uh, everyone will understand, is we have taken our 17 goals from last year and put them under five goals. The state has restructured the template upon which we report our work and so we have realigned those under five uh, larger goals there are eight state priorities that still maintain with us and in alignment with our district's mission goals and objectives 
Um, so we're gonna be reporting out the budget with it. So you're gonna hear multiple voices up here speaking. So um, we we're trying to do this all in tandem. I think the other really important thing is that uh, this is not a static document. This document can change and in our course of our work we may need to change and then we will inform the board and community around those updates. All right, so with that, which one? I'm turning the wrong one. No. I'm going to do it that way. Oh, I have to turn it on. That helps. All right. So to remind us all um, of the goals that our board adopted a couple of years ago, um, this is our mission. Uh, college and career readiness for all of our students. And within that, we have the goals to ensure that each student engages in a challenging 21st century learning experience. We develop and maintain communication systems that create collective engagement among all stakeholders and we create a collaborative culture of continuous learning for all staff. Uh, the shift uh, to LCAP priorities and processes has solidified this synergistic work that we must do together to set large priorities that support our students each year as we prepare them for their future. So just a really quick reminder of the eight priorities for LCAP. So when we talk about what do our plans need to live within, it needs to live within these eight priorities. And these eight priorities are actually put into three categories. So what I'll do is I'll put them in the three categories for you and then I'll describe each one. And I don't have the eight categories. So the first one is conditions of learning. So what you have here, one basic, which is um, all teachers are assigned to credentialed areas and that we have standard aligned instructional materials and school facilities that are maintained in good repair. That's what's in basic. Um, the implementation of the standards is that all of our work, curriculum, instruction, and assessment must be aligned to the state standards and the performance standards, and that includes ELD, our English Language Development Courses. And course access, which is number seven, this is a condition of learning, uh, requires us to offer a broad course of study that includes all core subject areas. The second area is called pupil outcomes. Pupil outcomes includes number four, which is pupil achievement, and this is the performance on our state assessments, reclassification rates of our ELD, and other achievement metrics that you will see as we go through our presentation. And it also includes other pupil outcomes, which is number eight, and it uh, ensures that we offer courses in career tech, uh, visual and performing arts, and physical education. The last and important uh, area is engagement. So number three around parent involvement, that we are seeking parent input and recommendations and parent participation in programs, especially for our unduplicated pupils in special needs subgroups. Number five, pupil engagement. That in particular looks at attendance rates, chronic absenteeism, dropouts, and graduation rates. And six, our climate. It looks at our suspension and expulsion rates and survey, surveys of our staff, students, and parents on safety and well-being, and do our students feel connected to our schools. Last time uh, we started the PowerPoint with just some overall general statements that we uh, received from three big uh, parent surveys. One is a parent perception. Overall, I think it's important to note that many of our respondents are very pleased with the education that their students are receiving in our district, but that doesn't mean we don't have room for growth because we certainly do. All right, in terms of setting our goals, uh, we brought this forward last time. These are all the different pieces that are involved in setting up our goals. So tonight we'll be presenting these, which you've heard. Uh, and all of these are in support of our mission um, and initiatives that we have. Last time at our meeting, we shared the qualitative and quantitative data that support this. I will not be bringing that forward at this time. Tonight, in place of that, we will be sharing with you the metrics and the budget that go with each one. And again, like I said before, last year uh, when we set forth, we did a two-year plan. We have updated it uh, based on some of the input from our community. 
and uh, we will continue to do that as we move forward. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am quite excited about presenting a very balanced non-deficit spending budget for the 2015-16 school <coughs> year, and I'm glad you all stayed to listen to this. The budget, when we talk about, <laughs> when we talk about the budget as a standalone piece, I always concentrate on types of revenue, type of expenditures, and of course the dollar amounts. What the LCAP does for our district, as well as all districts in California, what it has done is has changed the paradigm of the budget. We no, no longer look at it just in matters of numbers. What we look at is the LCAP as, and the budget as the driving force in order to meet those goals and get those programs for our children. So it's actually taken budgeting to a higher level and I truly enjoy working with Dr. Robertson and Ms. Hogarth on the budget because it's set, it set a different lens for us. So when we look at the entire budget, $327 million is what we are planning to spend in 2015-16. And all of this has to somehow fit into the LCAP. And when we do that, there are actually only two major categories for the budget. The first one is the rigorous academics, $260 million. That is 80% of our budget. And that, what that encompasses is our qualified teachers, our administrators, all our classified staff, the professional development that we, afford, we can now afford to give to all our staff, the instructional supplies, and everything that helps with the teaching. That's the $260 million. The second portion is the safe, clean, orderly school environment, 20.5 million, which is 6.2% of our budget. This we do in different programs, such as the deferred maintenance for our schools, the routine restricted maintenance, the custodial staff, the safety, and we'll be talking more in detail about these different areas. The other part of the budget, which is about 14%, is the 46.8 million, and those are considered other operating expenses. They do, do not directly link to the LCAP goals, but we do have to have the utilities, the insurance, the debt payments, and all of that to have a full budget for the district. And that's how the proposed budget, when we talk about LCAP, it takes on a different life of its own. Next, the next slide. We had identified, as Dr. Robertson mentioned, five goals to further improve our student success and student outcomes. 281 million of that falls under those two categories that I spoke about. The LCAP plan now will further delineate some of those expenditures and we will show you how we have the fiscal impact of 23.7 million in these different plans. In, on May 14th when we presented the LCAP to the board, we identified the color legend or the color key system that we use. We've kept it consistent this year also so that the budget document is easy to read. When you see the light blue coloring, it is the base grant, the base local control funding formula. The supplemental will be in the orange and that is the monies that we receive based on certain population in our students the low income, the English language learners, the foster youth. It's called the targeted population, and we will be spending those monies also towards the LCAP goals. Other funds, mostly federal funding, Title I, II, III, and so on, that we will also use for the low income, the English language learners, and we will be talking about those funds also. The dark blue is the career technical education, formerly known as the ROP. And the last but not least is the <coughs> light, light pink. It is the restricted lottery funds. The governor does give us funds that can be used, um, that, that are restricted for the purchase of instruction materials. So those are the legends that we will be using as far as the color. Next, next slide, okay. So as, as we 
spoke earlier, we will be showing you how we will be spending $23.7 million towards the LCAP goals. And in the base grant, we will be spending 9.7, supplemental 6.8, other funds, mostly federal funds, 5 million, the CTE is 1.1 million, and the lottery, restricted lottery, is 985,000. And as we go through the goals, we will break down each of these components for you. Thank you, Malaga. So as a reminder of the five proposed LCAP goals we brought forward before, uh, the number one is support high quality teachers in their implementation of an articulated California standards-based curriculum instruction assessment to ensure college and career readiness and citizenship for all students TK-12. Our second one is to create systems and structures that provide multiple pathways of learning and engagement to increase college and career readiness of our students and close the achievement gap for all subgroups. Three, strengthen and maintain safe, healthy, positive, and attractive learning environments for all learners. Four, increase parent and student engagement and learning through enhanced community involvement in, our, in the education of our students. And develop, implement, and embed a collaborative learning structure and system for adults and students to increase student achievement. As we go through our actions, uh, you'll note that many of them fall under various goals. And I think that's important, and that's about the synergistic work around all of this, and that's how we measure, uh, do multiple measures around each one of these. So our first action and service under goal one is around the implementation of our standards. This is a large piece of work that really keeps the instruction and supports for student learning at the forefront of what we do each day. And I want you to all keep in mind also this work that we do includes English language development and special education. This is a total systems effort. We work as teaching and learning colleagues to develop, plan, facilitate, and lead this work district-wide. Um, I noted last time that we were going to shift away from core work of math. We still have some math work to do. Uh, but we are going to be shifting into the English language arts and to science. And our focus that we take on is aligned with the adoption of the frameworks and the standards at the state level. Um, that doesn't mean we ignore all the other subject areas, because we don't. There's critical work that happens throughout around the literacy standards. The allocation of dollars that you'll see in a little bit in this area is to support teachers through release time, summertime work, and collaboration across the district to ensure a high quality curricular instructional program for our students. In addition, this funding has also been used to support staff development needs to shift to the state standards in all subject areas, which includes developing teacher leader experts at each site so that sites will have a team to embed and support the work um, in their everyday uh, engagements uh, with their staff. The funding will also support two teachers on release for the year. Ken Matson, uh, who you have all been, you've all seen, will continue on with us to uh, finish up the secondary math work, and Lynn Heyman, who's been leading the math work at the elementary, will be shifting her work to support uh, those in the ELA. Also in here is all the instructional materials, and this does include some funding for library materials as we move forward, but also they're revisiting around where is the role of digital resources as we move forward. So I think uh, we need to really look at where do, where's the crossover between holding a textbook and also the digital materials that our students uh, do uh, also access. Um, we, uh, we have continued to do some work with high school resources. Um, I, know I always remember Ms. Beatty sharing with me how old the health book is. <laughs> and so that's always rung in my head. And we do have an assessment of where those textbooks are. And we are going through and working with our teachers with the upgraded standards. Every time we bring courses forward, we will be updating um, core resources for all of that. So, so these learning and supplies. And one thing I want to note that um, the resources are really uh, the board head chair. This is a priority with all of us and wanted to note that uh, it is uh, everyone's priority to make sure we have those uh, available for our students. Uh, also, as part of this work, um, is looking at the, the VAPA, which is a Visual Performing Arts and uh, PE. Uh, this year, what we did was we gathered data around what programs do we have. Uh, one of our community members noted that they felt there were uh, different programs at all of our sites. It did come forward as a forum 
uh, priority and what we're going to do this year is take that data that we have and we have a group that's going to come together and make a recommendation to the board on a multi-year plan around how we embed uh, the visual performing arts and PE as part of the core curriculum every day for our students, especially at the elementary. We offer courses at middle and high, but wanting to get a core program there. One of the other goals is around decreasing uh, staffing ratio and class size. I'm gonna have Tracy speak to that for a little bit and then I'm gonna tag on with her. When Malaga starts to talk to us a little bit more about the numbers and the funding, um, and I'm sorry that some of the community members left so they would have an opportunity to hear how excited we are about reducing class size. We've actually allocated in TK3 $1.5 million, which equals 19.29 full-time teaching equivalents for TK3. We've also included in four, five, and secondary an additional $1.5 million to reduce class size, which is an additional 19.29 full-time equivalents. So that's an additional teaching of 38.58 full-time equivalents, which is exciting for us to say that we are gonna be able to reduce class size and continue our efforts to provide good opportunities for students. So, um, So what this actually looks like um, at the middle school is um, we're trying to uh, allocate enough so that our core classes are um, at 34 or below and many of them are at this point. At the high school we had targeted uh, last year ninth grade courses to be at 34 to 35 and uh, the 10 through 12 core classes not to exceed 40. Uh, what this will enable us to do is take grades 10 through 12 and I've asked the principals to develop um, a master schedule that'll get them to 38 or less in the core classes. So these are uh, core class targets. Uh, did we talk about elementary caps? So, so the caps at elementary, what you'll see at TK, uh, they are going from 26 this year to 25. At K1, it's going from 28 to 26. In 2-3, 28 to 27, and at 4-5, 34 to 33. Um, really excited about all this. Our sites are excited. Uh, our community has shared this. You've all shared this as a priority. It's all of our priorities, and uh, this will be work that we will continue to bring forward every year. So um, really pleased with that. Um, another one of our efforts is to increase the percentage of diverse certificated and classified staff that serves our students. So uh, we will be able to uh, attain a baseline data this year through our new program called MIGHTY. And so this year we'll get our baseline data and then what we will be able to do is we'll be able to follow our hirings um, from here on out. And I think, do you want to speak a little bit to keep it? Sure, I think also one of the things I'd like to say is that in regard to our diverse certificate and classified staff, this year two of the directors in human resources, Don Zweibel and David Hall, have met with um, our employee groups, both management, certificated, and classified. We've invited diverse employees to come in and talk with us and share with us what are we doing well to recruit, what are we missing, what can we do better, how can we reach out, and we've taken all of that information and are starting our work probably in a much more collaborative, efficient way, and hopefully we'll make even more headroads. We're also working with our local universities and colleges in trying to um, recruit as many of their student teachers as we can that are diverse. They understand that's what we're looking for, and we hope that they will continue to work with us. They've been very helpful in that way. We have a program called the Poway Professional Assistance Program. If you haven't heard of it, it's called PPAP. It's actually a nationally recognized program, and it <coughs> provides training and coaching and evaluation on standards-based instruction, student-led goal setting, and technology for our new teachers. It, we served about 100 teachers this year. It's first and second year teachers. It's part of our development program, but also helps teachers clear their California state credential. We have amazing teacher consultants that are released full-time, full-time support for our newest teachers, helping them learn everything that they need to navigate the instruction for students, and we support them along the way. It's a fabulous program, and we're always thankful for that support. The students benefit from those wonderful teacher consultants who support the first and second year teachers. 
And so the metrics that we're looking at for goal number one is one, to ensure that all our teachers are within their subject area expertise. And like I shared earlier, we're going to develop a baseline around our staffing diversity. Um, other measures we're going to look at, we are going to get our baseline data this year on the Smarter Balance assessments. So this will be a uh, foundational year and then we will grow from there. And the Williams Act and also the alignment of curriculum, we just need to, uh, the way we can measure that is uh, our adoptions moving forward aligned to our state standards. So this document shows us uh, the funding sources for goal number one and all the activities that Nell, uh, that Dr. Robertson and Ms. Hogarth spoke about. Uh, I've been often told that the LCAP is not an accounting document, but somehow the numbers have to tie in, right? So <laughs> here it is. <laughs> so for <laughs> the hiring of the 38 teachers, um, the instructional textbooks that we will be buying, and the elementary uh, teacher leader stipends, we will be spending $4.4 million, and that is coming from the base grant. The 930,000 that's coming from the supplemental program, we will use towards professional <coughs> development for all staff. For the TOSA, the teacher on special assignment that Dr. Robertson referred to, as well as release time for teachers to attend professional development, as well as classified staff to attend professional development. The pink portion, which is the lottery, 985,000, that is uh, purely for instructional materials for our students. That is a total of $6.4 million. In goal number two around systems and structures that provide multiple pathways, uh, our actions and services um, include the following. Our ELD program is completely embedded in here. Uh, this is the staffing, our aides, parent liaisons, curriculum materials, and our teacher and special assignment. Uh, we want to ensure that our English learners are accelerating as they move forward in our system so that they too are college and career ready and we are getting them ready wherever they are to move forward. Included in here is also intervention funding for our schools. Uh, typically what we do is we allocate this on a per unduplicated student count. Embedded in here as we heard earlier is our college bound work. We will be working closely with them around ensuring that our students are college and career ready. Um, we have uh, Kathleen Porter, as you know, she has brought forward many courses uh, throughout uh, or this year and last year as you've been here and uh, increasing the pathways that we have at all of our schools. Uh, you all have shared that that is a priority for you and I wanted to make sure that uh, that was uh, pointed out. And probably uh, some of our focused and newest work is with response to intervention and instruction. And basically the question we continuously ask as a system is how are we intervening to ensure our students do not fall behind? And what's important there is that it supports both academic and social emotional needs so that our students come to our classrooms ready to learn. And within here uh, we have added counseling, uh, more counseling to our elementary schools another day and we've added a half counselor to all of our high schools. And, and we need to make sure that we have a systemic process and Mercedes uh, Hubschmidt has been working on that and I think in a couple of years we are going to have a full-blown K-12 system around making sure we are intervening along the way for every student. What's not mentioned here that is really critical is our systemic work with culturally responsive learning environments. Uh, that is uh, work that we have started on, uh, but we need to go deeper with all of our staffs and, and our students are really good about sharing with us uh, what are the next steps we need to make to ensure that they feel safe coming to our schools and so that their parents feel safe coming to our schools and understanding our system. So we have a lot to learn uh, from our students. Also in this is the uh, inclusion of staff development around RTI, ELD, um, the culture responsive learning environments, but also for AVID and our advanced placement program. So what you see here are lots and lots of metrics. These are metrics that we have carried forward uh, for many years and I believe has served us well in terms of assessing our programs not only at individual schools but as a system overall 
and it helps us to get better every time we are looking at the data. We go up, we go down, we look at different schools. What strategies are you using? And we learn well from one another. So I won't go through all of these metrics. I'm happy to answer any questions on there. But I think it's important to note that the multiple measures for us are critical to understand, you know, like MAPS, by students so that we can develop an educational pathway or program that ensures their success at meeting the academic standards. Uh, some of the things you'll also see here is uh, sometimes we look at things that, like enrollment. Are we increasing enrollment by subgroups into our AP classes? Do we have too many males in our computer classes? You know, those are the kinds of patterns we look at and we look at how do we change that dynamic. We don't want to be predictable. We want to be unpredictable and we want people to note that. So for goal number two, we are right now allocating $8.5 million and the base, the light blue, the 1.9 million, majority of that is our contribution to the career technical education program. The county office also gives us some funding for that. So with that, we are able to provide um, best alternate programs for our students. The supplemental grant, the $2.2 million, a large portion of that will be allocated to the school sites and Dr. Robertson and the LSS team will be working with the school sites to make sure that the program um, meets the needs of the students that generate this money. Um, the $3.1 million in other funds, a large portion of that is our technology program. It's called the Refresh or the Rethink program, uh, whereby we meet the needs of our students, provide computers for the SBAC testing that we are now doing, and make sure that we have all the technology needs as well as the technology trainers and the support that's needed at the school sites. And the last uh, uh, dark blue segment, 1.1 million, is the career technical education programs. Uh, we do have a lot of teachers in those programs at our high schools, the supplies that we need to support those programs, as well as the Carl Parkins uh, program grant that we receive from the federal government is spent uh, along for those alternate programs in the high schools. The total for uh, meeting goal number two is $8.5 million. And goal number three around maintaining safe, healthy, positive, and attractive learning environment for all learners. Uh, we have put PE in here for the healthy piece. So as I shared earlier when I talked about the standards, we were um, gathering a group together to talk about what does physical education look like aligned to standards at our elementary. It's also uh, what you'll find in here. So that's part of the uh, actions that we're taking here. Uh, the mental, physical, and emotional health of our students and staff is really important with all of this. And so ensuring we have structures, staff, and curriculum in place system-wide is what we're wanting to achieve with this goal. So I talked about earlier about the counselors. Again, uh, we can speak to the counselors here. Um, again, increasing to two days. Um, last year, I want to remind us that we did add student support services personnel to our sites to support curriculum, as well as being available for student needs. I know at our high schools, they have an office, and there are students that come in and out of there all the time just talking to our student support services. It's a safe place for them and really important. Um, in addition uh, to uh, some of the work that we have here, uh, we have added a TOSA in our attendance office. Um, who will uh, who works with our students who are not coming to school and they do home visits and figure out how do we get you back in school so you're feeling safe and you are re-engaging uh, in our work and uh, making sure that they have the resources they need um, and I just want to note that uh, these are some of the board priorities that came forward and so just want to share that and Mulligan is going to speak to the um, site facilities and maintenance piece I'll move the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <There> you go. <laughs> I can't guess. <laughs> oh, I have my metrics. Sorry about oh, that. Okay. All right. So uh, before Malaga speaks to that, I am sorry, Malaga. Uh, there are various metrics that you see here. Um, a lot of these are suspension and expulsion data rates. How are our parents uh, or how are students feeling at school? How do our parents perceive uh, that they're feeling uh, at school and we have all of this data that we look at in, in conjunction with all of the forum data and other pieces of data and we have goals that uh, when we give out the parent perception survey every 
two years, if you look at one, two, three, go at number, bullet number four, there's an increase of 3% on the parent perception survey data that student, their students are feeling safe at school. So what we'll do is we'll take those goals and we'll assess them and we'll figure out how did we meet that, how did we not, and then reset ourselves around our next um, actions. So uh, what's really important around assessing ourselves is we take a moment to do that and then we look at research. What is research really saying? We're looking at our practices and then we develop a plan for our next steps. So uh, we are always thinking about moving forward around this work uh, to make sure our students are feeling safe, engaged, and we are going to be looking at uh, curriculum around bullying and uh, definitely at high schools. Uh, we've talked about some social media stuff. What do we need to do ahead of time uh, to prevent that uh, experience by our students. And now Malaga, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we, in goal number three, we want to continue to maintain safe facilities and increase the maintenance staffing so that we can have safe, attractive, and healthy environment for our students and teachers and staff. And uh, along with that, we have uh, allocated $6.4 million towards goal number three. The base, 1.6 million, majority of that, almost $1 million worth of that, is allocated for deferred maintenance, the fixing up of our schools. We have a lot of leaky roofs and pavements that need to be um, redone, so we are looking at that this year. We'll be spending almost a million dollars <coughs> there. We also have budget set aside for the regional communication systems, which is the radio systems that will help us communicate with other agencies, police departments, highway patrol, fire departments, in case of an emergency. Um, others, we have um, campus uh, supervisor safety training at all our school sites. All of that comes from the base grant. As far as the supplemental gr grant, as, as Dr. Robertson mentioned, majority of that is for our counseling program. Counselors at our school sites, psychologists, as well as student support um, assistants. The last item, which is the um, yellow coloring, 1.1 million. Uh, we have custodians and other operational staff that we're br br bringing back. We lost over uh, almost 75 custodians. We're trying to bring back 10 at a time, and we have that in the budget for this year. We're also increasing um, our staff in the groundskeeping area so that we can bring back some of the landscaping. Even though we don't have much water, we're trying to <laughs> make our schools look attractive. Um, we also have a contract with the city for drug dogs that we use at the high schools, and we use um, the one point, no, we don't use 1.1 million. We use $10,000 towards that. <laughs> That's <laughs> a lot, lot of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and goal number four around increasing parent and student engagement and learning through enhanced community involvement. Um, so one of the things that we did was we redefined the state's definition of student engagement. Uh, the state's definition of student engagement you'll find under goal three for us. It's really around chronic absenteeism, expulsion rates, et cetera. So uh, our definition is uh, a broader one around um, engaging our students and parents around curricular and co-curricular areas. Um, so uh, what this is, and we heard this quite a bit, is really broadening the integration of like robotics programs um, into other levels. Coding classes, we heard that many a time. Uh, looking at strengthening science Olympiad uh, we heard earlier today someone was interested around GATE. We are going to be revisiting our GATE programs this year. CTE, Kathleen couldn't be more excited around creating pathways of STEAM into the middle and elementary and also how do we expand Project Lead the Way. So our work this year in this particular area will be um, how do we embed these programs and opportunities to engage our students in passions and relevant learning as they explore areas of interest. So, um, and also, how do we engage our parents in this? We have such a great involvement of our parents in Science Olympiad as it is right now. We might be able to engage that around coding. We might be able to do that around some of our STEAM programs. So how do we broaden that out? And also, uh, with our community partners, how do we get them involved in all of this work? So a lot of the measurements uh, that you'll see here is really increasing the number of students' participation, parent participation, uh, community partnerships. 
uh, making more pathways. Uh, those are some of the uh, baseline data. We're going to have to develop a system around how do we do, how do we uh, gather all of this data so we can see what our total community engagement is. And for goal four, we've allocated $1.3 million. The yellow and the orange, the supplemental and other funds, mostly concentrate on parent involvement. Um, the blue, the base, is where we are allocating $794,000 for the music programs at the elementary schools. And we are very proud that we are finally able to bring back the band uniforms for our high schools. We also have allocated $100,000 for musical instrument, as well as we do rent the Poway High Performing Arts Center. All of that is captured in the 794. The total for that goal is 1.3 million. And in goal number five, this is around developing, implementing, embedding collaborative learning structure and system for adults and students. So collaborative learning um, is a 21st century uh, critical um, attribute for all students and adults. Um, is important to embed in both our learning in our classrooms, but also in our learning in the workplace. So systems like MyConnect, students can collaborate with their teachers and with one another. Uh, students can also collaborate on projects. So it doesn't always have to be online, it could be in class. Or t we have students now that are collaborating on how to solve math problems. There isn't only one way to do that. On the adult side, uh, we have a really strong teaching and learning cooperative for teachers to create their own staff development plans and work with others either at their school or throughout the district. With PSEA, we have a release person who's coordinating the professional learning program, and they are currently interviewing and selecting mentors for colleagues in the workplace. And PSS is currently working with SEIU to develop their professional learning program. And, all, and for all learners, we think that technology, or we believe that technology has a role for expanding and blending learning for all. It's around flexibility and it's around access. And as many of you probably go to fields on the soccer fields, people are doing things on their phone and they're doing work wherever they're at. So how do we access that around learning for all learners in our system? So how do we measure this? Well, we measure this in various ways. Um, are we increasing our um, ability to have 24-7 access and collaboration for all students and, and staff? You know, when are they learning? We can find out when they're learning. Um, do we have more online and mentoring uh, options for people? Uh, are we going inside and out of our, outside of our system to allow learning to happen? So we're going to have to figure out how we measure all these different pieces because these are critical uh, for to expand the learning of our students and so and for our students to really direct their own learning and their own passions. We've had a district group called Poway PL, and they um, it's the Poway Professional Learning Group, and this is a group of certificated and classified people that have come together, and they've been talking about what is staff development, what is adult learning, and they have a multi-year implementation plan they are continuing to work on, so I give kudos to that group um, as we move forward. Uh, the other piece we need to uh, pay some attention to is while we have been working uh, staff development, at least with our teachers, we have um, not spent as much time with our administrators through some of that, and we've seen that as a gap for us in our work, and so we need to make sure that we focus on that and the collegial work that we have going through. For goal number five, we've allocated a million dollars. A large portion of that is coming from the base LCFF grant. Uh, some of the components of the 824,000, we have a teacher evaluation program uh, run mi in Ms. Hogarth's office. We fund the adult education program uh, from these base grants. We also have an uh, online school, virtual school, and we fund the teacher learning cooperation through this. The total is a million fourteen thousand. And those are our five proposed uh, goals along with the actions and services. Um, 
Our next steps are we will have a second read and adoption of goals, action services, as well as the operational services, which Malaga will uh, speak to a little bit more under different green sheets. And our goal is really to have submission of this plan and our budget to the San Diego County by June 30th. And we are happy to answer any questions from the board. That's a lot of information. Thank you. That was wonderful. A lot of work. Are there any questions? Mr. Sellers. When, when this comes before the board, these are, these are separate legal items, correct? The adoption of the LCAP and the adoption of the budget. It's not, they're not one. They are, they one. are two separate items. Okay. There will be two green sheets, okay. uh, one for the LCAP, and then the following one will be for the budget. Okay, thank yes. you. Any other questions? And this just occurred to me because uh, at least one member of the public men mentioned buses, and I know that we got some kind of a little extra tidbit from the state regarding transportation. That's not in here yet? Uh, uh, not yet. Um, just today, June 15th, was the deadline for the uh, g budget committee to get their numbers together. The governor, though, has, is not in agreement because the budget committee, the conference committee, they call it, is projecting higher revenues for school districts. Uh, and the governor has not agreed to that. He does have the power of veto, but he's also considering some of the aspects. And so at that point, if the governor approves it, the increase to the transportation allocation will be included at that time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Pettifel. Um, I'd just like to compliment the staff on all their hard work. I know it takes many, many hours. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. And you got all these restrictions on how far you can go, what you can do. And I'm sure our plan is going to come out head and shoulders above all the other ones in the county for sure. But thank you very much for all your hard work and effort, and please pass that on to your staff. Thank you. Okay, I've got a few questions. Okay, oh, just to piggyback on the buses, uh, can, and uh, this, can we? If there's a way to increase the ridership, you know, without cost of some of the buses, and if that's something we can look into, it's just, you know, if they're not full. Well, we will look into that, Ms. Davies. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Um, I was writing down the notes for the class size reduction. There was a lot of split up, you know, between the different grades. What what was the four, five? It was uh, TK, TK went from 26 to 25. This is starting next year. K1, 28 to 26, T2, 3, 28 to 27. What was 4, 5? 34 to 33. 34 to 33. And then um, and when you said 34 below, that was for middle school? Right, in core classes. So that's core really okay. important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because we have uh, like the geometries at 39. Um, when my old, now f fourth year, college student was in ninth grade there was a program where the ninth grade English was at like 18 I believe is that a there was class size reduction at that time is that was a state mandate or that's that was just ours it was a categorical program to reduce ninth grade class size okay and, and okay. those dollars went away so when we allocated dollars the first time around in working with uh, PFT we we designated lower targets at ninth grade. I know it doesn't seem lower, but it was definitely lower than 10 through 12 core classes. You mean for for the 15, 6, year. oh, for last year? Or okay. this year. Mm -hmm. Not as low as it was back then. Right. Mm -hmm. But going into 15, 16, it's, you're saying mm -hmm. it's lower than 10 through 12. Correct. And I think you had addressed a program, you had mentioned of the additional counselors at elementary school, and you had addressed, I thought you had mentioned another program that was like the primary intervention program, which is advantageous because they're, they they're lower cost because you don't have the credentialed psychologists. It's just the trained adult. Oh, the student uh, services assistance? 
that are at the sites? It could be. It was, yeah. you know, it was described just like the primary intervention program was. You yeah, know, so at our high schools, they, they tend to serve that. They have an office and our student services assistants that are or there. This was elementary school. Oh, and our elementary, elementary yeah, schools. Yeah, we, with a, we put one counselor, uh, a a counselor day. one day a week yeah. in each elementary school. And we put student support services workers there. Three at hours the elementary school. Yes. And it is similar to, to the what, primary to intervention. You remember the it was right, changes and impulse control, and they could be out in the playground with a group of kids, or they'd be one on one, you know, and it would just be a trained adult. Right, um, and then we also have curriculum uh, that uh, our student support services uh, share with our students also throughout the day. And that's at the, you're talking about high school or? Oh, oh at, at the okay. elementary school. Okay. So I don't, yeah, I wasn't familiar with student support services at the elementary school, but it's through the counseling. Yeah, and Ms. Beatty, those student support services assistants are classified employees. Okay. Um, and I think something that we probably hasn't been discussed enough with all the technology um, and SVAC testing is keyboarding or typing. And is there any thought, I know the, we haven't discussed it much as a board, but uh, making some kind of mandatory requirement to teach uh, typing since that's a requirement to take the test. You're absolutely right. And uh, Eric Lee, who has been a huge advocate with us around trying to find what is that program and where should it be in our elementary right. curriculum? Because that's another piece that will uh, come into their program. So we have been talking about that and we do need to allocate uh, some funding to that, but we just haven't landed a, pro a district wide program on that. Okay. Okay, yes. So I forgot I made another post it here. Um, just a quick question. Under instructional materials that you can spend that lottery money on, I assume library books fall into that? Uh, yes, they do. Yes. Yes, Mr. Sellers. I just wanted to echo everybody's comments on the typing. I mean, when I was in, I took two years of typing, one in eighth grade and one in ninth grade, and perhaps the most valuable courses I ever took in terms of getting me through college. And I see my son, who has so much more knowledge of how the computer works than I do, but he's, he's very slow at input because he's never been formally trained on a keyboard. So, yes, I think that's an extraordinarily useful skill. Thank you. Mr. Zane. I'd like to sign up for that course too when it's available. <laughs> we'll be happy to have you in after school. <laughs> okay. Um, you had mentioned TOSAs that did home visits. Who, who does the home visits? So uh, it's a teacher on special assignment. His name is Ed Giles. Uh, he works in the attendance and discipline office and he works with our principals. So if we have students that are absent, uh, chronically, uh, then he works with the school, and sometimes they do home visits. Most of it, and it's really at all levels that we're doing home visits. And the goal really is to how do we bring your child back to school? Um, you know, for various reasons, they're not coming to school. And it, it, is it a threshold, or it's a principal referral? Or? It's both. Okay. It's we're monitoring data but a principal also may notice it first. They may have already had problems before and they've brought this person forward. We just had it this year, so we had had it before, brought it back this year to do that intervention and that liaison between the family and the school to bring them back in. So this last year, we just, it was when we brought it back, 14, Correct. 15, did that we notice year. an increase? Did that, I mean, clearly every student counts, so, um, but. Yeah, so uh, we have, I can't remember off the top of my head, I can get you that data around how many home visits we actually made and how many actually came back. For some, uh, I know that for a couple of our students, uh, we, um, we realized that New Directions was a better match for them and sometimes knowing that they have other options there uh, for their academic uh, program is important also. Yeah, yeah and I have no doubt I mean, the, f the families appreciate it. I mean, just, you know, from the emails sometimes we'll get as a board, I mean, it's a family in crisis and they, they want help, you know, from, from the, the school district or from any member of the community. So I will get that data for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll continue. Does anyone else have any questions? Because I'll just have a few more. Okay. You had mentioned plus 3% on a parent perception for students feeling safe, and I'm curious, 
if that is physically physically said because we've done a lot of security upgrades um, or is it emotionally and um, social emotional so if I can speak for you Eric because he becomes our guru he'll come up and he will share differently the uh, the statement is as is my student feels safe at school it doesn't really delineate physical, you know, the different things that you use to delineate. Is that a fair statement, Eric? So um, you're absolutely right in terms of the interpretation for that, and it's also true for our students when they are answering those questions. But whatever it is, we think it's important to look at all the other data around that and try to ascertain what is it. So we have questions around bullying that also are part of uh, that survey. So you have to look at multiple pieces and not look at the single piece that our goal is, is maybe other pieces get better and our parents will answer that. Three percent of them will answer that at a higher level. And um, Ms. Rolandi, when you were mentioning the custodians, it, that seemed drastic that we had cut 75 custodians. Out of how, how many? What's the total? And it's and then we and then we're adding back ten at a time. That just seems like a massive uh, cut. We had um, about 130 custodial positions in the district in 2007-8, and we cut them, and then we allocated some of them to work two school sites. But all of that has been uh, fixed, if you will. We have been hiring part-time custodians as well as we bring sub-custodians to work, but we are bringing back as many as we can. So with regard to so the, the 130, are you saying we've fully restored to 130 or we're certain percentage? No, away we from have that? not fully restored to 130. We added about 10 last year and we're adding another 10 this year. So we have a ways to go. And the, the allotment for the music program was 794,000. Is When you say the music program, is that the band? The it's the elementary it school that? teachers. We have... Um, Ma'am, correct me, them. five teachers that do elementary music programs at the school sites. Their salaries are included in the 794. And then we have 100,000 for band uniforms and 100,000 for replacement of band equipment. Can I follow up just quickly? Elementary band, fifth grade band is what you're talking about? Okay, there's other music programs in elementary school, just there are less than two. Elementary band. And then the communication piece, you had mentioned uh, the My Connect, and I think that came up as a parent issue. It was kind of the spotty, you know, some teachers were better than, than others with regard to, um, you know, posting assignments and communicating. Sure. So that. we're in our first year of really full implementation. There are lots of tools there to uh, continue to um, staff develop on. We are going to continue to embed that as part of our work. That tends to be kind of when we introduce something new. It's just learning all those new pieces. I mean, when we had Learning Point, do you remember Learning Point? So our Learning Point was also kind of a slow, and then we all we all moved. So just a little bit of patience as we learn to use all the tools in there, and I, it'll be really powerful uh, throughout. But you think part of the issue is because it was a new system that was just brought online. Um, Okay, this is my very last question. It's just with the online, I know there's been from community members an interest in expanding the online course options. Is that part of what we're moving towards or not at this juncture? Yes, it is. It is. So um, the online expansion occurs in Kathleen Porter's house. And what we do is we talk about what are those online courses that are of high demand. And so we actually put them on the CRFs, the course request forms to see how many students uh, wanted what courses. And we then we have to develop the courses also. So the answer is yes, and we will continue to be developing them. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just really quickly, I just wanted to say I, I love all of the baseline data. on In almost every single goal, there are several baseline data points that we're going to be collecting in all kinds of areas there. I'm just very excited about what those might allow us to put into our LCAP next year that That's true. a lot of things that open up there once we have that baseline so yeah thanks good job okay any other questions or comments from the board okay seeing none uh, this is a first reading and a public hearing and that concludes the public hearing thank you for all, for all your work and we're going to move on to F 
301, our next public hearing of the 1516 proposed budget, public hearing and first reading. We already had uh, public comments for this, so we'll, we'll go right to the presentation. Associate Superintendent Thalandi. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, tonight, we are very happy to be bringing forward the first reading for the 1516 proposed budget and the multi-year projection for the next two years. Um, I wish to inform the board that these numbers have been built based on the May revision to the governor's proposed budget. Um, any new considerations that have been made by the um, conference committee has not been included in here because the governor has till June 30th to sign the budget. At that time, if there are any material changes as established by the County Office of Education, we may have to revise our budget. It looks like there may be additional monies for the LCFF. However, the one-time grant that the governor has given may be reduced, so it may offset one another. That's where we are right now. Uh, the board has seen the Excel spreadsheets that I sent to you. I also sent you on Friday the SACS software. It is a many uh, <laughs> small typed huge document, but we are required by the County Office of Education to electronically send it to the board. Um, and the, the neat part about that is that it is extracted from the system. So it is what it is. The numbers come directly from the system and that's the SACS uh, software, which is a standardized account code software, is then sent to the, to the State Board of Education for them to approve it, right? So what we do is we take those numbers and put it into the Excel document so it's easier to read, and then we further put it into the PowerPoint so it's even simpler. So that's what I will be presenting today. But all three documents are um, the same numbers presented in different ways. So with that, I'd like to start. Um, I do want to take just one minute to thank and recognize uh, Joy Romero, Director of Finance. She's smiling back there. It's a lot of work to get this budget done and on time, and Joy does a very, very good job of it. Thank you, Joy. Um, the budget framework that we have used, as I said, it is no, this is the agenda. We'll talk about the budget framework, the proposed budget for 1516, and then the multi-year projection with the information we have right now. We have built the budget on the May revise. It is also built in accordance with the criteria and standards. That's like the report card that they use to grade our budget. It's a 27-page document, but it is very interesting reading. And if you, <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> It is because it actually tells you how we budget, the data we use. I guess I'm the only one excited, but it is, it, it is good reading. Um, the PowerPoint, <laughs> the revenues that I have projected for 1516, local control funding formula, $264 million. Of that, only 9.6 million is supplemental grant dollars. So it's such a low amount for our district. Uh, federal revenues, 8.9. Um, in that is included 4.9 for our special education program. We have Title I, Title II, Title III, and all of those programs are in there. If anybody is interested in the dollar amounts for each of those programs, it's in the SAC software. Other state revenues, 46.9 million, a big boost here because of our one-time revenues of $601 per child. That's $20.7 million for our district. That's the one that may decrease uh, depending upon what the governor decides. Local revenue, $11.6 million. $8 million of that is projected in donations. The rest of it, we have $1.3 million in bus pass fees. And then we also have um, what the county contributes to us for our CTE program is included in there. Total revenue is $332 million projected. Expenditures, certificated salaries, PFT as well as administration, 148 million. Classified salaries, SEIU, PSEA, and management, 53.1 million. Employee benefits, including health benefits for all groups, 67 million. Books and supplies, 19.3. 
services, 32.4, capital out outlay, 2 million, other outgo, 3 million, direct support and indirect costs, 353,000 to the good, for total expenditures of 326 million. Recapping those two slides, revenues of 332, total expenditures 326, excess of revenues of expenditures, not deficit spending, 6.19. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's a very good budget. Um, total other financing sources and uses and contributions. Last time the board had asked me to give details on that. I will do that in the next slide. Net increase, $7.6 million. What is um, the other financing sources and uses? We have what we call transfers in and transfers out between district funds. Transfers in from our special reserve account, from our community facility district, and our other post-employee benefit account is $682,000. Other sources of revenue is our computer lease for the Refresh Rethink program that I spoke about earlier, 2.5 million transfers out to special reserve funds, to other post-employee benefit funds, property liability insurance fund, 1.7. So netting all of that is the $1.4 million. Are, th are there any questions on these numbers? No? Okay. Um, the contributions, uh, we contribute 40.8 million from the unrestricted uh, general fund to the restricted. Majority of that goes towards our special education program, $30.9 million. Our routine restricted maintenance account, $9.8 million. This includes the new 3. Point, it was 3.5, now it's 3.9 million that we had to transfer this year. The TPP, the Transmission Partnership Program, uh, we are required to match it by $63,000 for a total of 40.8. So projected beginning balance for 1516, 36 million. Net increase that I explained before, 7.6. Projected ending balance, 43 million, 43.7. Set aside for reserves, 43.2. Unappropriated fund balance, $500,000. I will explain the 43.2 that we have set aside. Um, revolving cash and stores, these are operational pieces in the district. We need to set aside 382,000. Carryover for categorical programs, $3.6 million. In that is included our um, restricted lottery as well as <coughs> our Prop 39, the maintenance program. Carryover for sites and departments, $7 million. A lot of that is uh, donations, PTA monies and ASB monies that we have to set aside. The unassigned 2% economic uncertainties that we are required to set aside, 6.5. Reserves to reduce deficit, 3.1. Reserves to balance the 16-17 budget, 22.5 million for a total reserves of 43.2 million. Later on, uh, I have another green sheet where I have to explain how come we have such large reserves. <laughs> Can you believe that? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these two last numbers, the 3.1 and the 22, that's what I will be talking about in, that, in the next green sheet, okay? So for the total reserves, $43.2 million. 1617 projected budget, projected revenues, 315 million, projected expenditures, 335, excess of revenues, that should be deficit, 20.3 million, other financing sources, 1.3, net deficit, 18 million. I do want to remind the board that this is a very conservative projection based on SSC. Once we get the go ahead to do use the DOF, the, the deficit will not be this high. Projected beginning balance, 43.7 million, net decrease 18.9, projected ending balance 24.7, set aside 24.2, unappropriated fund balance 500,000. 1718 projected budget, projected revenues 321, pro pro projected expenditures 347. In 1718, using the SSC model, we're projecting a cut of 16.1 million. We did ra run the numbers using the DOF because our board members had asked for that. 
If we do that, we have no cuts in, 16, se in 17, 18 also. Deficit spending by 9.9 .9 million, other financing sources and uses 1.3, net decrease 8.5. So the projected beginning balance 24.7 million, net decrease 8.5, projected ending balance 16.1, set aside for reserves 15.6, unappropriated fund balance $500,000. So this is how the budget is as, as presented by the governor in May. We have updated most of our accounts, all our accounts for the budget. There's another important piece here, and that is the, the budget for this year, 2014-15. We just have a few more days till June 30th, but in July, we'll start cleaning up all the accounts. So the ending balance as projected may come in slightly higher, which will then change this budget. It will be always be for the better. So our next steps, we will be bringing back these numbers to the board for adoption on June 22nd. Any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, Mr. Patrick. Malik, I want to thank you for, for making I laughed at when you said about the budget, but um, you can make the numbers interesting, which is, is very unusual because usually uh, you get a report on the budget in the last few years is nothing but doom and gloom. And here you have a, a fantastic report. I want to thank you and your staff. Outstanding work. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Mr. Zane. I just want to thank uh, Malaga for not letting me down. She promised ex ex exuberation, excitement when she presented that. She didn't <laughs> let us down. Thank you. Can't help it. <laughs> Don't wear orange Same pants like TJ does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Just in the, in the interest of brevity and trying to get us all a little extra sleep, um, I will have some questions for you, Malaga. Okay. And I will send them to you over the course of this next week, and hopefully that will cut down on how much time we spend up here a week from today. I'll, I'll answer the questions. Sure, I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Well, um, just wanted to ask about the uh, the one-time monies. Why are they doing it that way? Is that because of um, Prop 30, and are we not going to see one-time monies the following year? Well, actually, that money is really 1415 money. The 1415 state revenues came in so much higher than they projected, not just in regular revenues, but also in Prop 30 revenues, income taxes and sales tax. Rather than give it in 1415, the governor decided he would allocate it in 1516, and rather than put it into any programs, he said he would do it as one time. And there are reasons why he does it one time. He says he is lowering the wall of debt that he owes school districts by making that one-time payment, and he calls it um, reimbursing districts for mandated cost reimbursement. And then on the other side, when he's talking to the learning division of the house, he says, we can use this money for Common Core, we can use it for SBAC testing. So it's not the best place to be, but that's how he's doing it. The reason I don't like him saying it's for mandate reimbursement is because every district is getting this money and not all districts applied for mandated reimbursement. He is giving $601 to charter schools also, and they don't even have mandated programs. So, you know, so that's the, but um, he is not putting it on Prop 98. He's not putting it to LCFF. He just wants it to be one time. And the other trick, if you will, of doing one time is exactly that. It's not ongoing. So. And 98. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had one, I, and I know I realize I asked you this ahead of time, but I, the, under the 4,000 series supplies, school budget standard restoration. Yes. A million dollars there. What is that used for? You told me how much per, per child, so I, I have a vague idea how much each school is going to receive, but is this the reams of paper um we're not going to run out of paper towels in the bathroom that that kind of thing so we're taking some pressure off parents to 
give supplies to yes. teachers? Yes, that is exactly right. It's been uh, the board priority as well as district priority um, that we fund our schools so that uh, the schools are not depending upon PTAs or parents or ASBs to fund for basic things. In 2007-8, we cut those budget standards almost by 30%. And now that we have the extra money, we are restoring those budget standards by spending $1 million. So but each grade level has a sif different allocation. So for example, the elementary schools used to get $29 per child uh, for their, uh, we call it the budget standards money. Now it's going up to almost $43 per child. And to continue on that, because I was curious also where the money would go to, because having worked on PTA boards, you know, it, I know it's not just the, you know, reams of copy paper, but we we're paying for um, the work, you know, the iPad carts and the, and the workbooks and the, you know, art teacher and the reading, whatever, uh, specialists. When so where, when we where do you think the money will? Yeah, when we allocate the funds, Miss Beatty, when we give it to each school site, we put it in different buckets. We call them office supplies. We call it subscriptions, library supplies, audiovisual supplies, copier contracts. And so each um, account number is increased by that budget. But it's up to the principal, <coughs> the vice principal, or whoever manages the budget at the school site to make decisions on how they would allocate those money and how they will spend those money. Thank you. And in that count, when we allocate those monies, the special education students are inc included in that count as well. So. And I know you have the operational, uh, you didn't go over the operational priorities, you went over that on the, at the May 14th meeting and that uh, <coughs> drills down more some of the um, budgetary expenditures. With yeah, yes, Ms. Beatty, the, on May 14th, I had shared with the board the operational priorities, uh, the workload budget, as well as the routine restricted maintenance budget. All of those pieces have now been included in the 15-16 budget. Okay. And so for three of us who were there for the ribbon cutting ceremony at Abraxas, um, we want to make sure that uh, Principal McLeod knows he's getting a van. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's in the budget. Thunder. Yeah. He was he was actually asking for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Are there any further questions from the board? All right. Seeing none, that concludes the first reading and public hearing of the fifteen sixteen proposed budget. Thank you, Ms. Balandi. Welcome. And our last item. is 302 first reading and public hearing of reserves in excess of minimum reserves in 1516. Ms. Thalandi. Thank you, Ms. Madam President. Um, this is a new item that we are bringing to the board. This came about because of Proposition 2, which was enacted last year. And Proposition 2 aims to put a restriction on the amount of reserves a school district can have. There's been a lot of opposition to this. Even CSBA was opposing this measure because it takes away any type of emergency planning on school sites. But being that it is now in law, um, it will go into effect in 2016-17 because if the governor contributes even a dollar to the rainy day fund, this proposition too is triggered and he does have money this year to put into the rainy day fund, he's planning to put $1 billion into it, which means school districts should not have reserves. That doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So what SB 858 says, though the law doesn't go into effect till 2016-17, school districts now have to show that they are already thinking this way and that they are able to explain any excess reserves that they have. So that's the whole idea behind this green sheet. And what the County Office of Education has done is if you see the attachment, there's page one of the spreadsheet, that's a County Office of Education uh, spreadsheet. So we start with the ending balance. So I, will, I would like to read this to you only because we are, we 
we are required to do so. <laughs> so um, we start with a $43 million ending balance in the 15-16 general fund budget. To that, we have to add 604000 which is the reserves in the cell tower budget um, for our districts. It's fund 1742. So we are left with 44 million. Of that, 6.5 is the 2% reserves. We are left with 37 million. And the 37 million is what I have to explain. They call it a statement of explanation, and those are the numbers. So I, as shown in the Excel spreadsheet, 382,000 is set aside for revolving cash, 3.6 for deficit reduction, 7 million is set aside for school site and department carryover, 25.6 million is the unassigned that I have to explain in the next uh, page, and then 500,000 is the unappropriated fund balance. Turning to the next page, you'll see we start off with the 25.6 million, and what Dr. Collins suggested, and it was a very good suggestion, is to split that 25.6 million into one time and ongoing. So if you see that one time we have 20.5 million, ongoing I have 5.1. So with that, we have set aside some, um, we have identified some expenditures that have been prioritized for our district. The first one, computer labs for testing at sites, 952,000. Professional development for all staff, 500,000. Special education additional staff, 238,000. Assistant director in purchasing, 110,000. And ac another accountant in finance, 65,000. Repair and upgrade radios at all our sites, 40,000. Safety plan for site phase two, a million. Deferred maintenance at sites. We have a lot of projects that need to be done, five million. Set aside for def deficit reduction, 10 million. Set aside for LCAP priorities, 7.7 .7 million. That will be the accounting for the 25.6. So the 7.7 .7 million is not identified as expenditures yet. Do you have any feeling about whether that explanation is going to fly if and when this happens to us? Um, yes, it will. I already sent it to the county office, and I said, make sure you tell me that this will fly and <laughs> yeah. before it comes to the board, and, and they said it would. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Sully. Yeah, unfortunately, as Malaga knows, this, this is going to be sort of an annual uh, battle that she has to fight with the COE of justifying the amount of the reserve. Um, the wall of death that you referred to previously, you know, when when this law was put into place, a lot of people assumed and others even sort of stated that, well, that wall of debt is going to be there for a long, long time and we don't have to worry about this until that wall of debt gets paid down. Well, that wall of debt is projected to go to, to zero and starting next year, mm -hmm. this would take effect. Uh, I was at the CSBA General Assembly meeting two weeks two weeks ago, a month ago, somewhere around there. Uh, it was a very worthwhile exercise. Um, it's a group that I think works very hard for our interests. Uh, the Assembly is mostly the lobbying arm. Um, pretty much every legitimate educational lobby in California opposes Proposition 2. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the one that supports it is the CTA, which has 330,000 members. <laughs> And so basically they, they are trying, they have pretty well given up efforts to change this legislatively because they believe the governor is too closely tied to CTA for that to ever happen. So they're doing it through the courts. They have had pretty good success with some other issues and they are cautiously optimistic that they might be able to get this overturned in the courts before it takes effect. But that is what they're applying a great deal of their time and money to right now. And so there may be a flicker of hope down the road. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to have to take some creative writing classes or something because <laughs> this, this will be ongoing. The irony of that is for the last eight years, we've been having to do just the opposite. We've been having to ask you to approve budgets, that, budgets with huge cuts that we knew weren't going to happen. Now that we have some money and we can put it in reserve, we have to justify why we're keeping oh, yeah. it in reserve. So, um, But luckily, we have the best CBO in the county, and she's going to take care of us on all of this. Um, Malik, I have a question. That, and I don't want to 
throw a wet blanket on anything, but it's always in the back of my mind of what year do we have to start reporting the our uh, liabilities for increased PERB contributions. And so this looks great right now, but when we have to start reflecting those increased liabilities. Uh, you're asking about the liabilities for STRS and PERS. That goes into effect when we close the books this year. 2014-15 is when we start reporting those. However, what we have to remember is those liabilities, the portion that's applicable to our district is not booked in the general fund. It's booked in what's called GASB 45, which is, an, which is the governmental side of accounting. If you look at our audit reports, you will see in the beginning of the audit reports the government, governmental-wide accounting, and that's where it's reported. It does not go into the general fund. Okay, any other, yes. any other questions or comments from the board? All right, uh, that concludes our first reading and public hearing of the 15-16 balances and excess of minimum reserve requirements. And that concludes our meeting. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can go home and have dinner.